The 17th century in Paris frequently saw the all-too-familiar scene of poor beggars holding mutilated children. These men were wretched, deliberately injuring these little children to arouse pity in passers-by so as to make a living. One good priest, not going to fall for such tricks, came across such a beggar. He immediately rescued the poor child from its torturer and brought it to the Couche saint Landry, where the poor abandoned children found a home, or at least should have. This priest was more than disappointed to find this place one of further torture for the children on a different level. The women running the place treated the children like animals, neglecting their needs, and sometimes would drug them to keep them from crying out, as little children often do. Realizing this was not the answer to his problem, this priest found another solution. But we will continue this story later. First, we should learn more about this priest. He was born at Puy on April 24, 1581, and spent his early life tending sheep. He was a brilliant boy so that the neighbors wondered why his other brothers were not doing his job so that he could study. Eventually, his father did send him off to study, and at this time, many men pursued the priesthood for monetary advantages to help their families. Likewise, this boy became a priest for these purposes. When a priest of about 30, he even wrote to his mother that he was laboring to retire and spend the rest of his life with her. However, he was a good student. His ordination to the priesthood happened when he was about 20 years of age. His first mass was in the woods, in a small chapel, to avoid the excessive attention easily given at that time to the newly ordained, who had the opportunity to show off for worldly advantages of their first Mass. With this being said, this young priest must have had desires more noble in his priestly soul than just wealth. One day, returning to Toulouse from a trip for monetary gain, while sailing along the Gulf of Lyon, Turks came on board the ship and captured him, to sell him as a slave at Tunis. He was bought by a Muslim alchemist who wanted to convert him to Islam. Eventually, the alchemist died, and his nephew got rid of him. This next priest master was a Muslim Frenchman with three wives. One of these women heard the priest chanting a psalm and the Salve Regina. She was so moved that she chided her husband for apostatizing from the Catholic faith, a rare thing to hear from a Muslim. The apostate was won over and reverted to the faith. He escaped to France with his priest slave as soon as he could. Our priest, now free, met Cardinal de Berulle, a popular church figure of his time. And while living with Cardinal de Berulle, he fell sick. And while ill, someone actually stole money that belonged to someone else from the room where this priest was recovering. Unfortunately, when the man to whom the money actually belonged discovered the theft, he blamed the sick priest, who was then denounced through all of Paris as a thief. Soon, God's justice found the real thief who fell ill himself and was dying. He repented of the way he treated the priest and sent him an apology. This entire injustice was suffered by our priest with the utmost patience and meekness. Around this time, he met a medical doctor who revealed to him severe temptations of doubts regarding his Catholic faith. The priest counseled the man and asked God to let him take the temptations on himself to relieve the doctor, which prayer God granted. He worked to overcome these temptations by performing acts of charity for the poor. When the temptation grew stronger than normal one day, he made a vow to consecrate himself to Jesus in the person of the poor. Immediately the temptation disappeared and his faith remained forever strong. Saints are friends to saints. He met St. Francis de Sales and said concerning him, quote, I am by nature a country clod, and if I had not met the Bishop of Geneva, I should have remained a bundle of thorns all my life. He took the gentle St. Francis de Sales for a model and how to treat others, from which he greatly benefited as he was prone to anger. Nevertheless, about our priest, Francis de Sales said, he will be the holiest priest of his time. After the royal family, the highest ranking family for, in Paris at this time was the de Gandhi family. Our priest was chosen to tutor the de Gandhi boys, which task, he said, was difficult, as the boys did not cooperate. Instead, 
their mothers took to his holy example and asked him to be her spiritual guide, which job he took on with care. He had a charitable influence on the servants at the de Gandhi home, like unto what Mary's example must have been like at the home of Elizabeth. There was one occasion in which he saved the count of the de Gandhi home from fighting a duel with the words, I know that you intend to fight a duel, and I tell you as a message from my Savior, before whom you kneel, that if you do not renounce this intention, his judgment will fall on you and yours. This good priest also has success elsewhere, by God's grace, such as the time he heard the general confession of a dying man who confessed that he would have been damned if he had not made that last confession. This prompted Madame de Gandhi to tell the priest to do something to help others in the area who must have been in the same unfortunate condition of spiritual want. He recognized the need and started by preaching, which reaped so many penitents that he had to call on the Jesuits in Amiens to help hear confessions. He began to grow well known for his success at preaching and skillfully winning souls for God, so that he asked de Berulle's permission to work at a parish to avoid the occasions for pride in his work at the de Gandhi's home. Some women of the parish were inspired by their priest to dedicate their time to serving the poor. One day, they came across a needy family. These women coaxed their spiritual shepherd to tell everyone at Mass so that this family's needs could be met. This petition granted, so many people rushed to this family's assistance that the priest realized he needed something more organized for helping the poor. This was the beginning of the confraternity of the Ladies of Charity. It was not long before the de Gandhis realized the absence of their runaway priest and persuaded Cardinal de Berul to bring him back. Once again, among this family, our priest observed that the galley slaves, under the care of the Count de Gandhi, all of whom were condemned and many of whom were in prison, were badly treated and needed care. De Gandhi gave the priest permission to care for them so that these men were physically and spiritually in good hands, thanks to a loving father of souls and some other priests who helped him. He proceeded to build a hospital to care for them and had so much success here that the king made him almoner of the royal ships and chaplain to the galley slaves. Madame de Gandhi tried to give the priest some money to start a missionary congregation, but he refused and told her to give it to another community. She tried this out of obedience, but impediments made clear that the money should go to her spiritual father. He finally took it thanks to her recourse to her brother-in-law, the Archbishop of Paris. A new community was now beginning, small in number, but causing, for many, the grace of conversion by their prayer and work. They spent nine months of the year on mission and three months to pray and prepare for future missions. Their missions were primarily for the poor. The foundation for this new group was established in 1625. Seemingly by divine providence, Madame de Gandhi soon died so that her guide could be freed from the care of her so as to be able to live and work with his new community without any distractions. Her husband soon after became a postulant of the oratory. This new congregation, which was made the Congregation of the Mission by Pope Urban VIII in 1652, was considered small for the times, namely 33 in number in 10 years. If only religious houses today had so many. Concerning his missionary's preaching, the founder said, Our sermons must go straight to the point, so that the humblest of our hearers may understand. Our language must be clear and unaffected. One particular method he employed was to help others make a general confession. Many priests at this time did not properly give absolution in the confessional. This priest saw the lack of formation of the clergy and began preaching 10- to 14-day retreats for priests at St. Lazar, which is where his missionaries lived. Retreats were also preached for the laity, especially the poor. No one was pushed away on account of monetary deficiency. A small seminary was soon founded by these missionaries, and in 150 years, they were in charge of almost 60 seminaries. Among the duties of this zealous priest was the position for a time as superior over the visitation nuns, which position was actually given to him by St. Francis de Sales, their founder. Louis de Gras helped him found a female congregation 
since the ladies of charity who lived in the world, as wives and mothers, could only do so much for the poor and the needy. This congregation was mostly composed of simple country girls. They lived disciplined and simple lives for the sake of the poor. Uncloistered sisters were unheard of at this time, so that they were often scoffed at. Nevertheless, someone told our priest, who helped found this group of sisters, quote, Monsieur, today I saw two of your daughters carrying food to the sick, and so great was the modesty of one of them that she never even raised her eyes. Now this is where the story with which we began ought to be continued, for it was when Louise's congregation was beginning that the holy priest, about whom we are speaking, came across the aforementioned child being harmed by a beggar. When he discovered the Couche saint Langerie to be an inappropriate place for children, Louise willingly took on the task of caring for these children. The women at the Couche more than willingly let Louise begin caring for them with her sisters. King Louis XIII, at whose deathbed our priest assisted, and Queen Anne of Austria, contributed to this work. The sisters eventually could provide for all the foundlings of Paris. The Thirty Years' War was waging, which made it hard at times for this ministry to continue. The priest enjoyed this work more than any other. Consider his following remark to the sisters about this job for the little foundlings. Since you began to look after them, they have numbered about 1,200 or thereabouts. They all have received holy baptism. And perhaps, if you had not taken charge of them, they would all have died unbaptized. And therefore been deprived of the vision of God for all eternity, and that is the greatest punishment of the lost. What would he say today if he lived to see so many children unbaptized in Christian homes? The queen decided to have something called the Council of Conscience for the appointment of bishops and abbots, as this procedure had become corrupt in France, which practice was in the hands of the infamous Mazarin, our priest was one of the five chosen to join the council. He met with opposition due to his decisions, determined to choose only the holiest men for positions in the church. When once he refused a man a benefice, he received the following insult. You are an old lunatic. The priest responded, you are quite right. Eventually, the council stopped meeting and, and Mazarin returned to fulfill the post of appointing bishops and abbots for his own ends. Concerning such matters, the holy priest said, I fear that this detestable barter of bishoprics will bring down the curse of God upon the country. Soon, thanks to Mazarin, taxes increased and people were starving even more than before. A revolution was feared so that the queen fled to Saint Germain. The royal troops were blockading Paris. This was the beginning of the Fronde, which was a rebellious movement against Mazarin's ministry. On horseback, the priest crossed the Seine River on a bridge which was flooded breast high to tell the queen at Saint Germain that Mazarin needed to be removed. This was a failed attempt on the priest's end, and the people started saying he betrayed them to the queen. He could not go back to Paris due to the trouble he stirred, but the people, getting hungrier by the minute, regretted how they treated him and he was called back to Paris. In 1658, he delivered his rule and constitutions for the congregation of the mission. While he neared death, he suffered from wounds in his legs due to chains he wore when he took the place of a galley slave many years ago. His whole life, he always woke at four o'clock in the morning, determined to give God his first action by prayer. Louis de Gras died before he did and is now known as Saint Louis de Marillac. Eventually, he was suffering so much that he could not even say Mass. He endured many sleepless nights on his hard mattress, never permitting himself to be moved to something more comfortable. When suffering such nights, he would say repeatedly, My Savior, my dear Savior. He received the last sacraments on September 26th. His last words to his sons were, May God, who began the good work, bring it to perfection. His last word before he died was confido, I trust. He died on September 27, 1660. The preacher at his funeral, Bishop Henry de Maupois, said, He just about changed the face of the church. Queen Anne of Austria stated 
the church and the poor have just experienced a great loss. This great priest, St. Vincent de Paul, was canonized in 1737 by Pope Clement XII at St. John Lateran's. The miracles approved for his canonization were the cure of a nun from ulcers and the cure of a laywoman from paralysis. His heart today is incorrupt. Luke chapter 14, verse 10 states, But when thou art invited, go, sit down in the lowest place, that when he who invited thee cometh, he may say to thee, Friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have glory before them that sit at table with thee. The humility of St. Vincent displayed these words of Christ the letter, especially as he expressed his, in his rule to ask for nothing and to refuse nothing. He never sought advantages for himself, yet it seemed they followed him wherever he went. He began his priestly ministry, it would seem, for himself. Yet, our Lord clearly was working in his priestly soul. Vincent, on seeing himself in a mirror, once said, What a fine clodhopper you are. He teaches us that pride makes us miserable, and humility keeps us truly content. He was not embarrassed to show up to court in a clean but old worn cassock, for which he was reviled, in the middle of countless clergy wearing silk. He was content with suffering, so that when he could not offer Mass, he was happy to hear one offered by another priest, probably less holy than himself. In his missionary help for priests, but most importantly, in this his example, towards the end of his life, he showed that there is more to being a priest than saying Mass and administering the sacraments. A priest will not do these things in heaven. To be a priest is to be conformed to Christ in his life, and especially in his death, to die with Christ, to be crucified. The highest science of a priest is not philosophy or even theology, but the science of the cross. In conclusion, hear the following words from St. Vincent de Paul. Feed upon the will of God, and drink the chalice of Jesus with your eyes shut, so that you may not see what is inside. Let it be enough for you to know that it is the cup of your sweet Jesus.